Good evening. I hope you're all well and uh, welcome to my Wellness Wednesday Instagram Live. I've just uh, christened it from last week. I decided I'd put a name on it. Um, you're all very welcome, whether you're watching me live or in the recording. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'll just introduce myself. There's been a few new followers to my page. My name is Louisa Cooling and I'm a nutrition and lifestyle coach. And I work with busy people and help them transform the way they eat and they live so that they can enjoy mental and physical peak performance uh, every day. Now, whether I'm working uh, with clients on a private one-to-one -one group or in the corporate setting, I always look across the four pillars of health, which are nutrition, exercise, sleep, and self-care, because really it's when we start to make changes and get a balance across these four pillars that we really start to notice an improvement in our overall feelings of wellness. Now, my guest tonight, well, I'm very excited. I first heard this lady speak when I was out walking one day and I was listening to a podcast and she was been interviewed about her then current book, 100 Days to a Younger Brain, which I immediately downloaded on Audible. Um, her latest book, Beating Brain Fog, uh, I also have on Audible and we'll be discussing that this evening. I am delighted, uh, and I'm gonna start patching her in now, to have the opportunity to speak with Dr. Sabina Brennan. Sabina Brennan, sorry. She is not only a best-selling author, she's a neuroscientist. She is a chartered uh, health, uh, um, sorry, psychologist, um, and also the host of the Super Brain podcast. So um, a very busy lady, and uh, I'm absolutely delighted that she has taken the time to speak with us this evening. So I am just going to... Uh, Send an invitation to her. Yeah, that's not working. Okay. Um, send an invitation. I'm trying to, but it's not working. Bear with me. Okay, um, Sabina, if you're watching, oh, I see you there, you've joined. Um, Sabina, can you see if there's a request there to actually join? I'm having difficulty in sending you one. Um, so if you see that there might be a box in front of you to request to join, if you click on that, then I should be there. It goes, fantastic, thank you so much. You should be with me now in a moment. Oh, Sabina. <laughs> Hello. How are you? I'm sorry. I couldn't get that request out to you. I'm not quite that's, sure whether the book that's is on no Instagram. Problem. They keep changing all the time. So I wasn't Oh, quite stop. Sure. Tell me about it. I have no, oops. I'm using a, don't move. <laughs> I'm using a, uh, I got a gift of one of these Osmos. So I just have my phone. Okay. So. It's, I can't show it to you because the phone is on it, but it's a device that holds your, holds your phone for you. So it holds it steady. So it's like a steady cam. Okay. Brilliant. Uh, which is kind of cool, but it's my first time using it. So, um, yeah, I'm just, I don't know where I am in the room because I'm not moving my phone. I'm trying to oh, move I know. this. <laughs> I know. Steady you, cam. you look okay. Well, hold on there now. You're. Yeah. You're just move there for a second. Right. Okay. That's fine. Okay. That'll be fine. Perfect. Perfect. Um, Sabina, thank oh. you so much. Thank you so much for giving us your time this evening. Oh, don't I, really, I really appreciate it. And um, I'm honoured that you're, you're doing this. I can't believe it. As I said on the introduction, I first heard you speak. It was years ago about your, your, your initial book, of, um, 100 right. Days. Yeah, and I, I downloaded it immediately. And it's just you now a few years later, we're, we're chatting. And um, as yeah. I said, I'm really, I'm really, really grateful. Um, to oh, you. not at all. Don't be silly. I'm just thinking I should have put a light in front of me because I'm dark. Am I very dark here? No, not very dark at all. No, because I can shout at my husband to get. I can shout my husband to get my yeah. light. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> would you get me my light from the studio? 
that's my podcast studio. Oh, yes. <laughs> if you can go like from my studio uh, and pull on the higher stand, and I'll just put it here behind me. Um, yeah. So, yes, your hair is fabulous, by the way. Oh, thank you. Gorgeous. Thank you. Yeah, we're all getting good at doing it at home, aren't we? Oh, stop. Yeah. Some of us better than others. You have lovely oh, volume in yours. <laughs> Well, yeah, thankfully, I will, as I say, I, I, I do it probably a couple of times a week, but always for my Wednesday lives. I love it. Oh, God, yeah, you'd have to. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Sabina, would you mind just even just giving us a background? I mean, it's a really interesting area that you've ended up in, but I know you always haven't um, been, I suppose, a, a guru in the area of brain health. Um, oh, which God, is no. Yeah. 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 What, what, so what, how far back you, what, you want me to share that I, well, I suppose probably the starting point in this area was I went to university to study a degree in psychology uh, when I was 42. So um, then um, I got a scholarship to do a, a PhD in the Institute of Neuroscience. Um, and that was around how the brain changes with age. And while I was doing that PhD, um, I really came across a lot of information about risk factors for dementia and, you know, ways that you can keep your brain healthy. And I kind of went, I don't know about this, you know, and then I kind of went, well, how come, uh, you know, other people don't know about this? And this wasn't brand new research, you know, some of this research goes back to the 1980s, you know, um, so... Is it not in the shoot? Oh, yeah, 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 it's upstairs. Sorry. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just, I kind of went, no, most people think that there's, you know, that dementia is, um, well, there's a misconception that it was a normal part of aging, but that it's genetic or that there's nothing you could do about it. And there was just this whole wealth of literature um, mm -hmm. on what you could do about it. So I kind of really just felt compelled to take that information that was just living in... Um, scientific papers and academic papers and literature uh, and kind of translate it into easy to understand information yes um for people to be proactive about their own brain health and to realize that you know memory loss and dementia is not a normal part of aging and there are certain risk factors lifestyle factors 40 percent of all cases of uh, alzheimer's disease are attributable to modifiable risk factors so like there's a serious um, uh, proportion uh, that we could actually minimize um, if, uh, if we got people to adopt a brain healthy lifestyle. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's kind of what I became passionate about. Will you lo just lower that down? So it's at my, yes. he's been very good here. He's, yes. Yes. That's great. Has a light. he's just, he just says, yes, boss. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, here, folks. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Yes. So then when I finished my PhD, you know, any of you who have sort of done a PhD or, you know, and, and you're working in the area of research, you really got to go and find funding for your work. So um, cut a very long story short, I uh, got funding to um, develop a brain health awareness program in multiple languages. I got funding from the EU and, um, you know, I was very, very passionate about is that better? <laughs> that's that, great. Is that, is that yeah. as low as it can go? I think you might be able to. That's better. Excellent. That's Thank you very much. Oh, he's just shaking his head. <laughs> no, that's great. <laughs> um, yeah, so that is better. So, um, yes, so my aim was just to basically, the web, that website still exists and lots of animations. Actually, if people want to visit my. Uh, website superbrain.ie at the end of that website there's resources including um you know the brain health awareness program that i, I developed which was a website animations and app and um, but basically just explaining how the brain works and how you can keep it healthy um, and that was back in so that was back in 2011 i got that funding so that's that's 10 years ago now so um i suppose i'm in academia then i three and three 16 years um, so now you all know how old I am, <laughs> if you do the math, but I don't mind saying that. But um, yes, so uh, uh, I ran a dementia research program in Trinity for seven years and then moved on to lead a study called BrainFit, uh, which is looking at brain health, lifestyle, 
genomics and dementia risk. Um, unfortunately, with COVID last year, um, you know, our participants are over the age of 60 and uh, up to 90 or more if they're willing to volunteer. And because we're doing genomics, we have to take blood samples. Uh, and because we're also assessing cognitive function, you know, people have to come into us for 90 minute assessment. Yes. You can't do them with masks on. You know, the tests wouldn't be valid. Um, and uh, so basically the, the, you know, the funding's gone and the, the study is, is, is stopped on that. That's, that's a real kind of fallout on that. I don't mind so much. I'm, I'm passionate, like over the years, whilst I was doing those, um, you know, the various other research projects in the program, I always insisted that, you know, I always wrote into my funding grants that there be, uh, you know, that whatever research we worked on, there would be an element to translate it the information for the general public, because I think that's the big issue. You know, yeah. most research is funded by the general public through taxes, whether it's European research or research just in your own country. Um, and I just think that people have the right, uh, you know, to know about it. But that's not really how academia works, really. You know, you're rewarded, yes, for bringing in funding, but you're rewarded by the number of academic papers you publish. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I look sometimes and I get, you know, kind of, oh, congratulations, new milestone on your academic paper. You've had 50 views and you kind of go, yeah, right. Had a million and a half views of, you know, such and such of animations. Do you, you know what I mean? Yes. I yeah, mean, I'm not course. saying this, you know, that kind of research has to be done. But I think the next level, you know, is as important, if yeah. not more important in a way. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating. And I mean, the thing that strikes me is like, congratulations in terms of going back to college and to start your study and embark on this journey at the age of 42. It is fantastic. And um... well, it was great, actually. You know, it was really good. A lot of women my age, um, you know, gosh, it's so, because so many people just go to university now, people have forgotten that that wasn't the norm for, yes. for, for women, for girls. It really wasn't. Um, and like Trinity, you know, I mean, that didn't, they didn't even used to allow women into to university. And, um, you know, there were probably a handful of girls in the school I went to, went to university. I'm from a very nice middle class area. Um, and uh, generally speaking, the ones, if they did go to university, were, you know, from um, daughters of, of, you know, doctors or solicitors. But actually, it's, it's funny, you know, I've done, for my podcast, I've interviewed a few people who were from the country and their parents, you know, one of them even comes to mind, um, you know, and they were from a really poor farm family and their mother had gone to university. So, you know, someone much older than me, mm -hmm. you know, in their seventh, you know, and I'm kind of going, how? But there was, that was a way out of the poverty sort of thing. There was kind of very, very, very different, but it wasn't the usual thing. I suppose if you did your leave, I would say that when we, when I was leaving school, doing your leaving cert was the equivalent of do, going and doing an undergraduate degree now. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Everybody, not every, like a lot of people finish school at their junior cert. Yeah, sure. Um, can we talk a little bit about the subject this evening, which is, is brain fog? I've had some questions submitted. Sure. They'll probably come through as we talk, but even just to start with, what is brain fog? What are the yeah. symptoms? How do I know I might have it? Because um, that's the best place to start. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's the best place to start. Um, so brain fog is, um, it's really a sign or a signal that something is amiss. Um, I'd like to kind of put it akin to a cough. So if you start coughing because something went down the wrong way or because you've been talking for too long or because you know you have a cold, you know, that's kind of explainable and understandable. Um, but if that cough persists, and continues for several weeks and starts to interfere with your ability to sleep, with your ability to, you know, carry out, we've all had those kind of prolonged coughs, mm -hmm. with your ability to, you know, speak a sentence without having actual a coffee fit, coughing fit, you know that you need to go to the doctor and sort that out and, you know, either get the underlying cause or you need an antibiotic. So it's, 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 but a cough isn't a disease, it isn't a disorder, it isn't a diagnosis. It's a signal that something is amiss and you need to figure out what the underlying thing is. So if you're just dehydrated, you drink water. You know, if you have an infection, you take antibiotics. But it could also be a signal of something more serious 
you know, yes. underneath as well. So brain fog is really sort of something similar. Um, it's not a disease. It's not a disorder. It's not a diagnosis in a, of itself. It very much exists. Um, it is, though, a sign or a signal that something is amiss. Something in your brain is malfunctioning because essentially that's what's happening. Now, um, the most common, um, it's really a collection of symptoms. Um, and I use the term brain fog as very much an umbrella term to describe those collection of symptoms, but also to cover all the various names that people have given it. Mm -hmm. So you may have heard of fibro fog in people with fibromyalgia, you know, cog fog, chemo brain, pregnancy brain, menopause brain, you know, there's been lots of different names. So I use brain fog as an umbrella term. Actually, the more scientific term would be cognitive dysfunction. But, you know, I learned that when I did that very first project about brain health, my first thing was, you know, nobody was talking about brain health in the concept context of just keeping that organ healthy. You know, and we tended in the scientific sphere, in the medical sphere to talk about cognition. But I didn't really know what cognition was until I studied, studied cognitive psychology. Do you know what I mean? It's not in common parlance. Mm -hmm. So that's why we kind of went with brain health. And similarly here, brain fog is a much easier thing, I think, to understand. But it does affect your cognition. Um, uh, so basically, the most common symptoms are um, mental, uh, lack of mental clarity, trouble focusing, trouble paying attention, um, a sort of a slowing of what we call processing speed. So feeling that when you someone is saying something, you're taking in information, that it's taking you a little longer than it ordinary would to kind of make sense mm -hmm. of what they just said and then mm -hmm. formulate a response. Uh, problems with memory, forgetting, um, forgetting to do things, forgetting things, um, problems with um, uh, learning. Uh, and by that, I don't mean academic learning, although that would be affected too, but um, learning new things. So if someone's trying to show you how to use the new washing machine or, do you know, and, and it just won't, it just doesn't seem mm. to go in and you kind of go, no, hold on. No, no, I'm not getting that. What did you say? Or a new process and work, you know, um, and learning and memory are very, very closely linked. Um, problems with language. So that's the word finding, not being able to find the right word. Uh, substituting the wrong word or a similar word. Um, a lot of people will have the experience of their life turns into a game of charades, <laughs> you know, trying yeah. to kind of describe yeah. what it is you mean. Or even a sense that, um, even a sense that your language isn't as rich as it ordinarily would be or as fluid mm. as it ordinarily would be. And then finally, um, the other one would be, um, it, we would call it problems with spatial navigation, but people generally would describe it as clumsiness, okay. bumping into things or dropping things. So they're the symptoms. And then the causes. Um, Before you even, do you yes. mind me asking you, because there seems to be an awful lot of things that you, you said there. I think people would associate with things like dementia or Alzheimer's. And, that, that, and that's, so not true. So yeah. basically, yeah, it, that, that's a real misconception. And I'm glad you brought that up. And actually also as well, just before I go into the difference between brain fog and dementia, um, all of those things I have described, everybody can nod to because everyone will have experienced those at some point. Generally, all you have to have been is a jet lag. You'll experience mm. it with jet lag. You know, insufficient sleep, too much stress, working too long hours, you know, all of those things will lead to, you know, pretty much all of the symptoms I've said or a feeling of mental fatigue and tiredness. The thing with brain fog is that the symptoms are persistent. They occur regularly. They interfere with your ability, with your quality of life, with your ability to do your job and even your relationships. So that's the parallel with the cough. So experiencing it when you know, you know, the dry mouth with the cough, well, when you know, yeah. when you know what, I, you know, I'm jet lagged, I'm really two hours behind, my brain's not working or I'm, you know, yeah. um, that's the equivalent of the cough, you know, or um, sleep or stress. And you kind of go, okay, I really need to get sleep. I really need to manage this stress. And then the fog will, will go away. Same with the cough. When you get over the cold, the, you know, the cough will mm -hmm. go away. And um, when it becomes prolonged, you need to start looking at what is the, um, of what is the underlying cause. 
Um, and basically, um, there are multiple possible causes. Um, they are, um, it can be the consequence of an underlying health condition. Um, it can be, uh, and I can come back and explain which health yeah. conditions in particular. Um, uh, it can be the side effect of a medication. It can be due to hormonal changes. Uh, it can be due to a nutritional deficiency. Um, and then also a consequence of certain lifestyle factors. And I've mentioned some of those already, you okay. know, poor sleep, um, stress issues, um, and um, lack of exercise and lack of mental stimulation. Okay. Can I just ask again, though, just to be clear, so everything you said there in terms of all those symptoms, you said when it Oh, yeah, sorry, the dementia. The dementia, how, do I, how does a person know that what they're experiencing is just it's brain not fog and that they can, and it is modifiable factors that you can make changes to diet and lifestyle to support improvements, or actually this is something more serious? Yes, absolutely. So, um, sorry, that was my, my fault. I didn't, I didn't. So, so dementia, it, on the other hand, first of all, generally speaking with, de um, with dementia, we'll say Alzheimer's disease, because that's the form of dementia for which there's the most research. Um, actually, to be honest, in a lot of instances, the person who's affected doesn't realize that there's anything amiss. Mm -hmm. So most of us that have brain fog, we know, we have an awareness. Oh my God, I kept saying the wrong words or I can't remember anything or, you know, whereas with dementia, the person often it's, you know, it's a significant other. It's someone else who kind of notices things that are amiss. Um, the kind of issues are actually very different. So if someone, um, you'd, you'd be concerned that someone may be having issues associated with uh, a form of dementia if they were repeating the same story over and over again without realizing it or asking the same question over and over again without realizing it. If they become lost in a place that they should be really familiar with um, and then confusion, um, you know, uh, and, and um, uh, um, uh, I can't remember the way to, to put it, um, uh, sort of a confusion about time and place. So not being able, not being aware what day of the week it is or what time of the day it is. So they're very, very different to the kind of things that we're talking about uh, with brain fog. And actually that's one of the reasons that I wrote this book, Beating Brain Fog. You know, I think particularly where hormonal issues are your underlying cause for women who are going through perimenopause and menopause. And I know you had some of those questions came yes. in. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, I think a lot of older women are terrified that the brain fog they're experiencing as a consequence of hormonal imbalance is actually the start of dementia. And they're not telling anyone, you know, they're kind of keeping quiet about it, etc. So it's to allay those kind of fears. Um, yes. Okay. And I think there's something quite reassuring what you've just said, Sabina, in terms of forgetting where I put the car keys or, you know, can't think of a word or somebody's name if I realize that I'm having that difficulty, that I'm struggling in a way that suggests that it is more brain fog than if I have repeated a story and I don't even realize it and somebody else is, is sort of noticing that things are a little bit astray. So for, yes. and again, that was the theme coming through this, that one particular question of a lady that was 56 and she is experiencing some of those symptoms, but she's afraid to raise it with anyone, particularly a doctor. And I think that's probably quite common. Oh, very, very common. Very yes. common. And look, my mum had dementia. I knew, you know, the ins and outs. I was running a dementia research program. I was raising awareness about the risk factors for dementia. And when I was going through a particularly bad period um, of brain fog myself as a consequence of uh, for maybe perimenopause at that point, but I have an underlying health condition, a couple of underlying health conditions, as well as you know, going through a period of particular stress and disrupted sleep. And my brain fog was particularly bad. And I actually even was going, gosh, did mom have it this early? Do you know, is, is this? And so I just said to my rheumatologist, look, I said, I'm concerned. My cognitive, you know, my brain fog has just got really, really bad. Oh, and of course, I was also on medications that, you know, kind of interfere with it. So, you know, I, he said, well, look, 
he said to me, you know, you know, as much as me, you know, how this works and, and what to do. He said, but he said, look, just put you at mine. We'll go to, you know, and I went to a neurologist and, you know, yes. I knew. He said to me, you know what tests I'm going to give you. You're fine, <laughs> you, you know, and, um, uh, and I was. But I still had that, that's still niggling, you know, it was still niggling, um, niggling away. But that kind of yes. brings me nicely to kind of go back, if people would like to know, the kind of underlying health conditions um, they, that, that, um, that can give rise to brain fog. And I should make it clear that even if you have an, an underlying health condition or a hormonal imbalance, the lifestyle changes that I, um, that I speak about in my book, uh, they will help. Do you know what I mean? So if, if the main culprit in your brain fog is an underlying autoimmune disease, adopting, you know, the brain, the, there's the book, by the way, folks. Adopting the 30-day plan will actually help you to um, minimize your symptoms and possibly even eradicate them. But the underlying health conditions, what's quite interesting is um, they are tend to be conditions that disproportionately affect women. So autoimmune diseases uh, like lupus, Sjogren's, so I have Sjogren's, um, um, uh, chronic inflammatory conditions, um, chronic pain so you'd have things like Crohn's disease celiac disease uh, migraine I have migraine also um, and a lot of people tend to have these in clusters you know yes. um, excuse me <clears throat> what is that um, very interesting Sabina what is that connection between autoimmune and brain fog can you can you explain that well there's there's a whole chapter in the <laughs> well it's just... there is sort of a whole chapter in the book you know <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> excuse me Sorry, <laughs> just let me get a bit, <clears throat> bit of water. Um, you know, we don't know for sure, because here, here, here's the thing. <laughs> Excuse me, I've got one of those. You're okay. I just take it here. There's, um, for those of you, there was a couple of people asked, could they submit questions here tonight? And yes, you absolutely can. Type them into the comments box. Um, just, Sabina, while you're catching your breath there, I'm just going to read through some of the comments here. Sure. Um, I would love to hear, I'll, I'll take note of these and come back to it, but I would love to hear about keto brain. My mom has been struggling ever since chemotherapy. So I'll take a note of that question and come back to it. Um, and there's another one here. Okay, they're glad to hear this conversation. Um, is dementia almost like psychosis in a way that they aren't actually aware of their deficiency in awareness and cognition? That was no. 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 Yeah, well, I can come back to those. Do you, yeah, do you want me to come back to those or? Yeah, take I, was those? Just, I was just giving you. I'm going to take. I'm going to take note of them. I just wanted you to catch your breath. Um, so again, it's the same thing. Whereas with brain fog, your cognition is altered, but you are aware of that deficiency. I think. That's yeah, kind that's of kind of. Yeah, sense. but I mean, they're you know that's kind of in the initial stages. But you know, <clears throat> sometimes people. With the dementia, it can come and go. So, you know, you can, not that the whole dementia comes and goes, but your self-awareness can come and go. Do okay. you know? So really sort of, I'm just really talking about that in, in, in the sense of, in kind of the earlier stages, do you know? Whereas we'd be very aware that our brain is sort of malfunctioning. It's okay. It's, 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 it's just slightly different. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a lot different really. But, okay. um, I'll, um, what was you going to say? You asked me about the autoimmune yeah. um, d disease. So, um, so autoimmune diseases where you're, you have a disproportionate sort of immune response and your immune um, system really starts to attack you um, instead of an invading body and different autoimmune diseases attack different parts of the body. So my autoimmune disease attacks the endocrine systems, which is uh, moisture glands in your body. Um, and, and sometimes I can get that, you know, the, uh, a, a cough. And I'm really very, very good. But um, when it was bad before I was diagnosed, I would cough, maybe wake coughing during the night. <clears throat> but um, um, really, if you think about it, when you're sick, your body, we have certain illness behaviors, you know, you, you mount an immune response uh, to fight the infection. And illness behaviors are things like, you know, needing to retreat and go into bed and address so that you can allow your, um, your body to fight the infection. Um, and so often you actually can't think straight and your brain will be a bit foggy, you know, around that when you're in the midst of an immune response. So it's most probably related to that, you know, that your immune response is sort of malfunctioning and, and believes that there's an infection, um, you know, in your system. But also a lot of autoimmune diseases are associated with chronic pain. Mm -hmm. 
as well. So, you know, if you're dealing with chronic pain, um, you know, that's going to impact on your ability to pay attention and attention. Actually, I didn't mention that, you know, uh, well, you know, difficulties paying attention are very much related to brain fog. Um, it's hard to kind of, you know, focus away from the pain onto what you're, you want to be kind of working on. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, inflammation probably plays a role and chronic inflammatory conditions, you know, are associated. I mean, the thing is, the interesting thing is, you know, there isn't a lot of research been done on, um, you know, brain fog. You know, um, you know, it's 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 definitely, um, you know, definitely exists. It's measurable. It has been researched in that regard. But generally speaking, what happens and from people I've spoken to and even my own experience in some regards, that often, you know, the doctors are keen to find out what the underlying cause may be, and it could be an autoimmune disease, and that's very important to find that out. But over mm -hmm. time, so for example, multiple sclerosis is both a neurological condition and an autoimmune disease. It, you know, the body attacks its own myelin sheets. That often doctors are very, very focused, and patients focused on physical symptoms, you know, that they will lose mobility and maybe end up in a wheelchair. And actually the primary reason that people with multiple sclerosis end up having to give up their jobs is to, due to the cognitive dysfunction, not the mobility issues, because they can get ramps in their job if they actually do. And actually the drugs are quite good now, the modern mm -hmm. drugs, you know, in terms of preserving their mobility, but actually their brain function, their brain fog, ends up being kind of one of the most debilitating things. So that's why, you know, I, I do a lot of work in that area with various groups and organizations internationally, raising awareness among people with MS about the importance of looking after their brain health. And mm -hmm. um, so we, there's not a lot in terms of the, me, you know, the actual mechanisms. I do my best to explain sort of in the book um, the possible mechanisms. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, we, you know, we kind of can't definitively um, say for sure. But it's enough, I think, in the book for people to understand yeah. what's actually kind of going on in their, in their own brain. Um, okay. Depression um, um, can um, also impact on brain health. Um, and then, unfortunately, as I mentioned, the side effect of medication, a lot of the medications used to treat autoimmune diseases, inflammatory diseases, pain, uh, cancer, um, actually have brain fog as a side effect. And that's generally speaking, um, part of the reason is for some of those medications, if you take medication for depression, for example, they're operating on the central nervous system. Um, and so that's going to have an impact. But, um, you know, uh, pain, pain medications, antihistamines. A lot of people, you know, can't take antihistamine. They just feel too drowsy. Yes. Um, but antihistamines, anti-nausea uh, anti tablets, uh, chemotherapy, which is what uh, somebody um, yes. mentioned, I think you were talking. Um, and uh, also some cancers themselves can bring it about. And okay. then also indirectly. So I mentioned as well that there are um, nutritional deficiency um, you know, can be an underlying cause. So, you know, say sometimes with chemotherapy, you may become anemic. And so it could be the anemia that is bringing around, you know, are contributing to yes. the brain fog. Um, other deficiencies are vitamin B12 deficiency and, you know, an in, a regular anemia, iron deficiency, a folate deficiency. And you'll know more about these, you know, uh, you know, in the general sense. Um, and even an omega-3 deficiency, they yeah. can um, bring around brain fog. And B12, actually, a B12 deficiency, the, uh, the symptoms of brain fog can go to an extent that they're so severe that they, they can be and have been confused by, uh, as dementia in older people by certain doctors, you know. Okay, that's really interesting. Actually, there's been a lot of comments in with regard to the medication that might be given out for acne, um, Accutane. And um, people have noticed perhaps uh, the link between Accutane and brain fog. And I think somebody has also said that medication that can be sometimes given out to um, younger people, so Accutane, antidepressants, birth control, and so on, um, can that impact on brain fog? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a fabulous book. I, I, I was actually talking on another, I must put, put it up on my, um, on my Instagram. I did say I'd put up the name of the book. Um, I, and it's something to do with what, what, the, pill, what the pill does to your brain. Um, probably have it in, here in, in the chapter at the end of the chapter. So yes, there is some evidence that, you know, in people taking 
uh, the pill that it may be impacting on the hippocampus, which is a part of your brain involved in learning and memory. Again, you know, more research is needed. Mm -hmm. um, I have been asked about Accutane. I actually need to go to the literature, but I certainly do know, um, and I didn't write about it in my book, but I certainly do know that, um, you know, some of those acne medications can impact on levels of aggression, etc. And if they're impacting on that kind of thing, well, then they're obviously working on um, some neurological mechanisms. Mm. So just by way of deducing that, um, yeah. I would imagine so. But I put my hands up. I actually don't know specifically, yeah. but it's kind of on my very long list of, um, of things to do um, in terms of, oh, actually, I know. But yeah, there, that, there is a, an entire book um, that was published last year, um, last year or the year before, about uh, uh, the possible impacts that um, the pill um, can actually have. Um, That's on another the question, brain. actually, as well, Sabina. There, there seems to be quite detailed in terms of, and I know these are just coming in now. So, um, but I think you have, I think you have covered covered it off um, specifically. <laughs> Yeah, and, and to be honest, I go, I do go into like you know detail in the in the book. There's an entire chapter on hormones, um, and it, you know it, it explains how your hormones work and how they really influence every aspect. We tend to just when we think of hormones, we tend to just think of our sex hormones actually, uh, and we tend to then just think of those sex hormones as being associated with reproduction and mood and and those kind of things but you have sex hormones all over your brain influencing billions of your brain cells so you know um estrogen testosterone they they play a role in pretty much every single aspect of your life so if they change with pregnancy or with pre-mens you know pms or uh with menopause or they've gone out of whack for whatever other reason or um you know, that's going to impact on, on your cognitive functioning and the very essence of who you are, because mm -hmm. that's all just part of brain function. You know, we would sort of say, oh, the, you know, you would describe personality as someone being a very calm person. And then they go on Accutane, we'll say, and they become kind of aggressive and, and it becomes who they are. But actually, it's really, you know, it's, it's, it's just how the brain is working and operating yeah. and um uh, that I'm just trying to see if I can see this. Know your hormones, um, but if I can't, if I can't read it out, I will. Uh, oh, this is your brain on birth control. That's what it's called. Uh, and I think it, it, the the author is Hill, and it's S Hill. So I think it was Susan Hill or Sarah Hill. Anyway, this is your birth on brain control. It's um, mm -hmm. uh, it's yeah, it's a really interesting read and it's a fabulous cover. The, there's you know a packet of the pill on the front and it's it's raised, um, but she goes into quite significant detail on that if people okay. are specifically interested in that. That's fantastic. Can we spend a little bit of time then? We've described what it is, maybe the causes, how it impacts us, and specifically your book, as you mentioned, Beating Brain Fog, is a thirty day program. It goes into obviously more detail into what we've spoken about, but then it does detail a 30 day program that people can embark on a journey, which is very worthwhile in terms of looking at these modifiable factors. And actually the four pillars you talk about are the four pillars that I would look across as well in terms of what we eat, how we move, how we sleep and how we manage our stress and ourselves. Yeah. So yeah. We well, I, I include mental story. exercise yeah. as well as physical exercise because that's, yeah. That's fundamental. I suppose, yes, as well, in some regards, you know, there's no rocket science in there, but, you know, but I, I would argue that your brain is your master controller. So if you, you know, if you look after your brain, your mental health will follow and so will your physical health. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the thing is that, um, um, you know, I suppose what I try to do in the book is explain to people why sleep is critical for your brain function because I explain what actually happens in your brain when you sleep. When you sleep, your, your brain has an incredible job of work to do. Um, but also, I suppose I was very conscious that if people are already experiencing brain fog, um, they're already feeling that life is a bit of a challenge. So I didn't want to come up with something that would make life even more difficult. <laughs> so actually, really, what the 30-day program is very much... Um, they're rituals, you know, they're about introducing very gentle, but very, very um, beneficial and 
I suppose in a way, life-changing rituals mm -hmm. that will reset your brain, revive and revitalize your brain and, and really kind of bring you back and bring you to a more balanced life, you know? Um, uh, and, and particularly at the moment with um, long COVID, that's what's been interesting. And I think I saw a question kind of flying up through there, are more young people getting brain fog now or, or whatever, mm -hmm. but you know, with, with the pandemic and COVID, so obviously this book, you know, I was writing it long before the COVID-19 existed. And, um, uh, but there's been a huge spotlight um, placed on brain fog now that wasn't there before. I mean, I know when back in, you know, February, March last year, when we were first learning about um, long COVID, I was kind of, uh, about COVID-19, I was saying, this is going to cause brain fog. It's going to impact on the brain. And we know that it actually has, you know, we hear mainly that COVID, um, you know, uh, causes damage. The re we hear a lot about the respiratory symptoms, but it also goes straight to the brain through two different routes. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people have brain um, issues, but then a lot of people who've even had mild symptoms are experiencing long COVID. Um, and that's not unusual. Often after a virus um, or if someone's had something like sepsis, they will have brain fog for, you know, up to a year afterwards. Their body has been, you know, your, your brain literally does absolutely everything, but its primary function is to keep you alive. Mm -hmm. And if it becomes under, you know, and, and you can see it in the evolution of the brain, you know, the brain stem is the oldest part of the brain. Um, and it's responsible for the things you don't have to think about, but that are vital to life. So breathing, digestion, heart rate, blood pressure, all of those things that keep you alive. If your brain stem, stem is damaged, unless you've access to a life support machine, you, you know, you're, you're gone. Life, it's not compatible uh, with life. The next part of the brain to evolve is the limbic brain. And that really is... Um, a lot of people will refer to it as the emotional brain, but that's where your amygdala would be, you know, for fight or flight response, but also for your emotions. And um, it also has as the hippocampus, uh, which is the part of the brain for learning and memory. So learning is how we adapted and changed and evolved. So that was critical for our survival. And it continues to be critical for our health. You know, if we can't learn, we can't improve, we can't adapt to our environment and changes. Mm -hmm. And then the last part of the brain to um, evolve is the crinkly outer neocortex. And that's the thinking part of our brain. Um, and that's involved in all main, you know, the activities that are affected in brain fog. Uh, uh, but also, um, you know, that's the part of the brain that sets us apart from other mammals, you know, and um, it got bigger and bigger, uh, you know, and more, more well connected. And that's what makes a really healthy brain. But if your, if your body is being assaulted by a deadly virus, your brain has to put as much of resources that it has available into keeping you alive, into fighting that infection, into mounting an appropriate response fighting it and then into trying to get you better. So remembering where your keys are or remembering the right word yeah. are not essential um, behaviors. They're not essential to life in the context. So I think that's a lot of what that is. Um, and with anything, you know, if, if, you know, if you've broken a leg or whatever, if you've been sick or in bed, you lose condition. You know, your body lose conditions and it has to gradually be reconditioned. And so mm -hmm. people after long illness have to come back very gentle steps at a time. And that's sort of applying with long COVID uh, in terms of brain fog, gentle steps at a time. But yeah. there's another thing in terms of brain fog and the pandemic, and that is that most people are experiencing brain fog of some kind. They're, you know, they're really struggling um, to carry out uh, you know, their daily tasks, they feel foggy, they can't focus, can't pay attention, things that they used to find easy, they're finding more difficult, they can't understand why now they're doing less, that they still seem to be, they seem to be getting through less in, in, in their work. And I think that's due to obviously the, the stress of living through a pandemic, the disrupted sleep. But I think a huge factor of that is related to um, habitual behaviors. Prior to the pandemic, 40% of our behaviors on average are, um, are automated, they're habits. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason they're habits is that your brain has limited resources. The thinking crinkly part of your brain uses up the most energy. 
And your brain is a very high energy organ anyway. So what it does is it constantly scans for patterns looking for behaviors that are regularly repeated that don't require thinking about and can be actually could be automated and so if it sees that you get up at seven o'clock in the morning walk to the bathroom have a pee step in the shower you know go down for breakfast brush your teeth get dressed walk down the road take the bus whatever that your behavior is every morning going to work um follow the exact same pattern your thinking brain can abdicate responsibility for that behavior to an unthinking part of the brain called the basal ganglia mm -hmm. and it therefore by definition becomes it's unconscious and it's effortless and it frees up um resources in the thinking part of your brain to do the more complex activities that we associated mm -hmm. perhaps associated with your job complex math functions or you know or whatever and suddenly a year ago everybody was just told to go home and work from home and most people just threw their routines aside that's so for so, most people that's so interesting it really really is that um it's 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 valid it's it actually makes an awful lot of sense because we are yeah, and, and, and we're, this, we're trying to change we, we don't have a pattern i think that's the thing yeah we're so your brain can't identify pattern. any yeah. pattern and so it's yeah. struggling so the solution is really really simple just reintroduce all your old routines and so if a lot of you are thinking that actually it's really only in the last year with pandemic you know, if you used to get up at seven and have your shower and get dressed, blah, 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 do that. And anyway, that will be good practice to get you back in the swing of things for, for when we do go back to work. Your old habits, old habits never die. They never, ever, ever go away. So once you start doing again, they will kind of, you know, kick in again. Um, I've been suggesting to people to do a commute morning and evening, even if it's just take a walk around the block. I've also been suggesting get into your work clothes and, uh, you know, in terms of this, you know, will help mental health at the end of the day, change into your comfies and, you know, maybe have a shower, tidy your work away. You know, a lot of people are working in their bedrooms and in their living rooms. And, you know, that's just a nightmare. You know, the only things that should happen in your, be in your bedroom really are two things and they both begin with S. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're so right that there's no demarcation between, mm. we don't have that commute to actually unwind and decompress. It's just maybe it's stand the up and yeah. walk 10 yeah. steps yeah. and you're in the kitchen and to mayhem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so you're not decompressing at all. And so your brain is focusing, you know, it's still going, going around. So very simple, you know, I mean, a 1K walk takes 15, 15 minutes, you know? I mean, even if you go 500 yards down the road and 500 yards back and yeah. I think things like uh, you know these are tricks that some people would do so so you know if there were psychologists and they're you know dealing and treating with patients with you know sometimes very challenging stuff that it's hard to kind of get away from your system is that in the commute to gradually just you know the commute home shut those down and then actually to shower it off and to change your clothes you know you know and they're just little tricks that do kind of help yes. um, and it takes it takes discipline um, and it will be effortful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, introducing a new routine is initially effortful because you have to engage this part of your brain and remind yourself to do it and think about what it is you're doing. Mm -hmm. But once you do it, you know, for a couple of weeks, depending on the, the task, your brain sees the pattern. And then by definition, your brain will grab it, give it over to the basal ganglia and it becomes automated. And, so um, I, have more, I have more space then. I have more. You have more space. space. Yeah. yeah. And basically, instead of your, using your cognitive resources to carry out that entire task, what your brain actually does, what your cerebral cortex um, does is it checks in at the start of the behavior and at the end. Do you know what I mean? So it has the trigger of the start of that behavior. Yeah, okay, that's fine. That can go into automation. And then at the end, there's like almost a little check. Did that go as planned? <laughs> sort of thing, you know? But honestly, people will see um, a huge difference. So it's a fine balance between... So our tendency, the brain, you know, will tend to look for patterns that it can automate, okay? And it doesn't care whether those patterns are, you know, healthy, helpful, unhealthy, unhelpful, whether they even reach the goal that you've intended it, them to reach when you engaged in the behavior, your brain doesn't care. It's just looking for a pattern. Okay. Um, and so, um, so it may be a case of just identifying 
new things, introducing them slowly, but but making a plan and then just putting yeah, it into no, practice. Conscious, so conscious. Conscious. So yeah, no conscious, so conscious. So you'll often hear a lot of people, so being present-minded is a great, a great way to counteract brain fog, okay? But we can't be present-minded all the time. You know, the brain hasn't got the resources for that. And, you know, that's why we have habitual behavior. So, you know, we need we need to be able to do some things on autopilot, mm -hmm. you know, those mundane routine things. But a lot of us slip into the habit of doing too much on that. And we don't think about anything, certainly in our sort of former, you know, former lives pre-pandemic and you do an awful lot of stuff on autopilot. So it really, again, with most things, it's about the balance. You want routines that you can automate and then, you know, important behaviors. And it's good to do a revisit. And in a way, I think that's what the book, kind of helps you to do mm -hmm. is revisit what habitual behaviors you've been engaging in, question whether they are actually contributing to your brain fog or whether if you tweak them or change them, you could actually use them to help eliminate uh, your brain fog. So it's just consciously figuring out and then introducing new rituals. I call them rituals in the book. It's a little mm -hmm. gentler, but ultimately they will become habits. Yeah. Um, and that's what you're aiming to do. And, and I should say to people as well rituals. that... I, I, sorry now, but they are some gorgeous rituals in terms of things as... Well, I don't think they're basic, but some people might in terms of laughing. And, you know, it just... I think that in itself, what that does, what laughter does and what smiling does, it's, it's unbelievable. The whole second week is about managing stress. And, yes. and all, always people always say, oh, but how do you manage it? People tell me to relax. People tell me to do this. And I kind of go, you look... Laughter is nature's natural stress buster. It actually lowers cortisol level. Slit, smiling has lots of health benefits. Um, it releases serotonin. And um, even if you fake a smile, you get all of those health benefits. So actually what you have to do in week two, um, and it does speak to the present mindedness, is I, you know, to spend at least a half an hour doing something that you enjoy, that makes you smile, that makes you laugh. And that you can lose yourself in, because if you lose yourself in it, you're present in that moment. Um, and honestly, you know, we've forgotten to do those things. If you, you know, you can push it to an hour, you can do it, whatever. But like I was just saying, look, just even give yourself a half an hour yes. where you, you enjoy life. And then I do have things like smile when you boil the kettle, smile when you pee, smile when you look in the mirror. But just to kind of, I think particularly during the pandemic, we've forgotten to smile. We tend to think, we tend to see smiling as reactive, something, you know, if someone smiles at you, you smile back. If something good happens, you smile. But actually, it doesn't have to be that way. You can smile wherever, whenever you want. Um, mm. And um, I've said this over, over again, you know, probably even back when you went, heard me speak first about my, my first book. But, it, 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 you know, sometimes people just don't think about it. But, you know, smiling... Like it, it, it boosts the growth of brain cells, lowers your immune function. Um, no, boosts your immune function, lowers your blood pressure, releases serotonin, ma you know, making you feel good, all those things. Um, and researchers figured out that just making that smile, you know, yeah. like I just look mad there now. Um, but just moving the muscles into a smile, so a fake smile, a synthetic smile, um, produces all those health benefits. And they did it by just getting people to bite on a, a pencil. Mm. And, you know, they could actually measure all the physiological responses. And I was really kind of going, okay, if the brain is the most complex structure in the known universe, mm. how is it fooled by a fake smile? You know, how is it fooled? And then actually I realized over time, it's not fooled by a, a fake smile. It has developed a very simple tool for all of us to get those, deal with those to get those health benefits and actually to deal with stress. So we have our own very natural stress buster in smiling and laughing. Um, and I think that's evidenced in how we've, you know, evolved certain behaviors, you know, mm -hmm. bereavement and losing someone to death is probably one of the most challenging things any human um, has to deal with. And what do we do at funerals, um, you know, or when we're waking a loved one is we laugh a lot. Yeah. You know, we, we tell those stories and, and we laugh. And I, and, I, and I think that's a, it's like a pressure relief, release valve in our brains 
mm-hmm. that because the stress of, of, of death and loss, it's too much. It's unbearable. You know, you, anybody's experienced it. It's like, oh, oh you know, you, mm-hmm. you, you literally can't even breathe. And I think that's sort of something that has evolved. Perhaps those of us who could laugh in those moments, you know, didn't end up dying of broken hearts or yes. taking our own lives or yeah. whatever, you know? Yes. I, I mean, I don't know. Um, I don't know. It's very, it's so interesting and I can really relate to it. And maybe it is a safety mechanism and you're in, you're in the back of the car with family and whatever and, and you're laughing, you know, about yes. something, about a story. And I think that's, I think that's lovely. Um, my goodness, we're nearly an hour in, Sabina. The time just flies. I talk a lot. I'm really sorry. I know it's, it's, it's fantastic. I think across the pillars, we've spoken about sleep and how important it is. And we have touched on a little bit of the physical exercise. And I know there's probably more to talk in terms of mental agility and keeping us focused. Yes. Um, we, we've touched a little bit on self-care. We haven't yes. touched on nutrition, but I know yeah. from listening to you, you're very much in favor of the anti-inflammatory diet, Mediterranean style diet. Mediterranean diet. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, obviously as well, inflammation is going to underlie, you know, brain fog, a lot of those chronic, um, you know, inflammatory um, uh, uh, diseases. Um, I mean, you'll know that the, the you know, the, the, the um, Mediterranean diet, it, you know, I mean, it literally, um, it, it provides all the nutrients that your brain needs. Um, it really does. Um, and in the purest form, you know, it's very close to um, natural. And I'm talking about adopting a Mediterranean diet, diet where you cook your own sauces. <laughs> You're not buying them, uh, you know, in a jar from the supermarket, you know. I mean, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing simpler than making a tomato and garlic sauce, you know.